We've introduced a couple type theoretic constructs so far, and we can put them into two groups. On the one hand, we have specific types we've introduced. So far, we've covered unit, bool, and empty in detail. But we've also covered another way of getting new types, which was the arrow type constructor. Arrow's a little different than unit, bool, and empty. It's not a single type, but a type constructor. As the formation rules show, arrow is actually a way of combining types to get new ones. For any types a and b, we get a new type, a arrow b. Once we've added arrow to our type theory, we suddenly have infinitely many different types available to us, because there's infinitely many different combinations we can make with arrows. Now we're going to add another type constructor like arrow, another thing which combines two types to form another one. Once again, we're going to discuss this new construct in our three ways of doing type theory. Informally, in the deductive calculus, and in the computer formalization. Let's start with the informal idea. You ever played a game of Battleship? Or maybe use the algebraic notation for chess moves? Or maybe you found your reserve seat at a theater? Or maybe you've edited a spreadsheet? Or described a position using latitude and longitude? If you've done any of these things, or countless others, then you're accustomed to representing a two-dimensional position by two numbers, or even a three-dimensional position by three numbers you've encountered the notion of coordinates. Let's look at this more closely using the example of a square. If I have a point somewhere inside of a square, the most convenient way of telling you where in the square it is is to tell you how far along the bottom it is and how far up the side it is. Mathematicians call this projecting. I project this point into its two coordinates. Conversely, if I pick any point along this bottom axis and any point along this side axis, I can pair them up to get a unique point somewhere in the square. Pairing and projecting are inverse operations. Every point in the square has a pair of coordinates, and every pair of coordinates gives a point in the square. Now the square is the space of points I get when both my axes are intervals. But they don't just have to be intervals. What if I replace this side axis by a circle instead? Take a moment to convince yourself that the space I get in the middle here is a tube. Just like before, the bottom axis is an interval. So if I have any point along the tube, then I can still project it down to the bottom axis and get a coordinate on the interval telling me how far left or right the point is. But if I project to the other axis, I don't get a point along the interval anymore, like I did with the square. I get a point somewhere on the circle. Here's a trickier one. What if both my axes are circles? Here's how I think of it. A circle is what you get when you take the two ends of an interval and stick them together. So if we take a tube and connect its two ends together, you might remember from several videos ago, we get a torus. And indeed, the points of a torus are just pairs of points on circles. The one coordinate tells you how far around the center hole you are. And the other axis says how far around the circumference of the tube you are. Mathematicians have a slick notation for this. They say that a square is an interval times an interval. A tube is an interval times a circle. And a torus is a circle times a circle. We also express this by saying that the torus is the product type, or the product space, of two circles. Maybe it seems a little weird to be multiplying spaces, since you're probably only used to multiplying numbers. But there's a good reason for this notation. Consider what happens if the spaces we take are finite sets. Say, for example, a 13-element set rank and a 4-element set suit.
How many elements does rank time suit have? That is, how many distinct pairs are there where the first coordinate is a rank and the second coordinate is a suit? You guessed it, 52, which is 13 times 4. In general, if I take a set with n elements and a set with m elements, then their product type will have exactly n times m elements. So we're not being ridiculous with using the words times and product. Okay, let's summarize real quick. Given any two types A and B, we can form their product, A times B, which is another type. To introduce terms of type A times B, we just pair up a term of type A with a term of type B. Now there's one other thing we ought to say about product types, and that's how to write functions out of product types. Writing a function from A times B to some type C just means assigning a term of type C to each term of type A times B. If you've ever filled out a table or a spreadsheet, you've already done this. For each little a and each little b, just write a term of type C in the cell whose coordinates are little a, little b. If A and B are both relatively small, finite types, then it might be practical to just specify each of these cells individually. But if A and B are really large types, or certainly if they're infinite, we'll need some kind of formula to calculate what value of type C goes in each cell depending on the cell's coordinates. And that's it. The formation, introduction, and iteration rules for product types are contained in what we've said so far, and you should be able to work out what the computation rules ought to be as well. Try that on your own, and then next time we'll go through them formally. See you next time.